Let's see. Okay. Um, I am sorry. I'm not sure that we record the Spanish version of it unless Alan can do that on his own. I only record the English as far as I know. So forgive me for that. Uh, if you are listening, um, turn your turn your speaker up and put your cell phone beside your 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 speaker, and then you can record it that way, just in case. Um, if you are uh, wanting it to be in Spanish, um, okay. This will be is will be posted on my YouTube channel. So sorry, coming back. Um, <clears throat> so we have Guru uh, Guru Vajradhara in the space before us. Uh, we invoked all of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. We made them merge, Ja Hom Bam Ho, uh, with that. And then we feel that the wisdom beings, all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the 10 directions of the universe, and our gurus, and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they all entered into it, their consciousness. And so they became, they became, started to perceive us as our practice. Then um, to your lotus feet of the Vajra holder, the jewel who is like, the guru is like a jewel. Um, that actually refers to what's called uh, all the all teachers in the aspect of a jewel. And so therefore, it said, although you might have, let's say, 10 or 20 or 30 gurus, like I have more than 34 in all of the four lineages, plus I have a, a teacher in Bonn. I mean, he's more my friend and I translate for him, but still he is a teacher. That in regards to having all of them, you can visualize them all if you want to. But this all teachers in, a, in one form of a jewel is, for example, uh, Vajra Dara in the space before you, and you feel that the essence of all your gurus are in that. And that way, then you include them all. Um, through whose great kindness, or who, through his kindness, the state of great bliss bestowed in an instant. The, uh, the word in an instant refers to one rebirth, one, uh, one, uh, just one rebirth. Uh, so it's not like that, you know, in one instant, but rather, in the period of one rebirth, it is possible that you could become enlightened. And so the, the best supreme would be you become enlightened. The next is that you, you go into the bardo, and for example, you, you meet the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and you go to a particular pure land. Uh, if not that, then um, it could be that possibly, you know, you, that when you're in the bardo, you have some opportunity to make some choices. Uh, and then finally, this, you know, that your, your accumulated karma is your security ticket for being able to uh, have a good rebirth in the sense of being virtuous and such, being very real about your practice. And that's what it's really important. It's like <clears throat> praying in front of other people or whatever. No, it's all, it's just about you and your relationship to your own spirituality and for the benefit of sentient beings. You know, if we look at the, um, Heart Sutra, you know, let's say, I, I like the Japanese version. It's a little bit shorter and easy to memorize. Um, so I can, Alan can't really translate, but obviously, so it's the Bodhisattva of compassion from the depths of Praja wisdom, saw the emptiness of all five skandhas and suffered the bonds that caused him suffering. No, then, form here is only emptiness, emptiness is only form, form is more than emptiness, is more than form. Feeling, thought, and choice, consciousness itself are the same as this. All dharmas here are empty, all of the primal void, etc. Now, what that means is, is that bodhisattvas, and especially the Buddhists, don't have a self-consciousness. It's not like, oh, I'm going to help this person or something. Like, they don't have a reflective consciousness back to themselves. Sorry. So, Alan, I'll slow down a bit for you. <laughs> so, the, um, so that, like, they're quite pure. Like, it's just, oh, you have some problem. Oh, may I help you? It's not like, oh, I'm going to help you. It's like, oh, just may I help you? It's just the empathetic response with compassion. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> anyway, uh, coming the next section is uh, 9a, uh, which is the uh, verses for the uh, eight praises to the Heruka, eight praises to Vajrayogini. Now, uh, I don't want to go through all the details of that, although many of you may have the uh, Heruka Chakra Samvara initiation that was given some weeks ago. Uh, I know some of you, I think uh, Jeffrey uh, just received the Heruka, Vajio, the Heruka Chakras of our initiation uh, in another you know, lineage, it's fine. Um, it's always just basically, I'm a Tantra Bodhisattva. So whatever lineage you receive it in, still you're just a Tantra Bodhisattva. You don't become a Karyu 
tantric bodhisattva or a nimata. So <laughs> you are a tantric bodhisattva. And that way then you, you accumulate great karma, you, you avoid the sectarian. So um, let's just say the eight praises for the for Haruka, eight praises for Vajrabini are unbelievably special. Now, if you are attending the uh, teachings of Vajrayogini, which will be starting on uh, May the 16th. Um, you, you might be familiar, May the 13th and 14th is initiation of the solitary Yamantaka. May 15th then is the uh, Vajrayogini initiation. And then the 16th, we start the retreat, which you do not have to attend if you don't have the time. And anyway, for those in Mexico, it'd be like at three in the morning, so it's not very convenient. But the teachings uh, are at seven o'clock at night in England, which is around 12 noon in Mexico, and you know depends on your, your time zone. Um, in that, then I will go through the, the praises of the Vajradini. So at this point, I'm going to skip 9A because I want to focus on other things a bit more. Okay, next uh, we have not A10. I present oceans of various uh, clouds of offering, outer, inner, and secret, arising uh, from owned and unowned actually arranged and mentally man, uh, emanated. That takes care of the uh, commitment of the five Buddha family of Amoga city, which is making offerings as much as I can. Okay. Uh, then uh, A11, oh, actually, well, I'm gonna talk about outer inner and secret, but outer of course is the outer offerings. Inner is the uh, transformation uh, of dealing with your delusions and secret is great bliss. So uh, we'll talk about it in a sec. Okay. Then 11, A11, the body, wealth, and mind of myself and others, as well as the wealth and collections of virtue of the three times, and excellent and precious mandalas together with all the massive Samantha Bhaga offerings. I visualize and offer to the Guru, Yidam, and the three jewels. To the force of your compassion, please accept them and grant me blessings. Yidam, Guru Ratna, Mandala Kamir Payani. So again, uh, just here again, extensive offerings, which is again part of, well, in this case, it says part of the uh, 50 verses of Guru devotion, but it also includes the uh, offerings, uh, extensive offerings of the Mogul city. And um, so again, I mean, I, I think most of you, you should have been practicing Buddhism long enough that you, you know, uh, you, you know about offerings. I mean, the, the seven branches of prayer and offering mandala and such, you know, Anyway, and if you haven't, then please do study. Um, your sutra studies are not contradictory to your tantric studies. In fact, they're completely complementary. Okay, uh, 12a or a12. Uh, you and all the sugatas of the three times and ten directions manifesting as a saffron robe monk in order to tame beings through the whatever means is necessary. And thus you perform the activities of the virtuous ones of countless hands to my precious guru, I make requests. Okay, as well praised by Vajradhara and the holiest field, for those who have inferior minds, you surpass all the infinite spheres of victorious ones. To my precious guru, I make requests. All supreme and common attainments without exception depend on correct reliance on you, my protector. Seeing this, I completely give up my body and even my life. Uh, please bless me to practice only to, which is to please you. Okay, now, the, the reliance on a teacher is really important, um, but it's important, you know, with, with let's say, as I, just, I explained at the very beginning on talk number one, and I think, I'm sorry, Chris, it includes female gurus, okay, uh, that, <clears throat> that, the more important thing is your side of what you're projecting. So projecting that the teacher has great compassion, has understood the voidness and such, it's a self blessing, you know? And so even if a teacher doesn't have those qualities or doesn't seem to show them very easily, still, you know, if you have that type of projection, you're blessing yourself. I, for example, um, although you, it said you should try to see all your gurus as basically, you know, Vajradhara and such. Um, obviously, some teachers might touch you a little bit more. So for me, for example, Lingram Poche, I, I got to spend much personal time with him. He was one of the tutors of the Dalai Lama. 
uh, you know, so I, I was a student for more than 12 years and such, and many special things happened for me with him. So what I often do is when I was attending teachings from a teacher I didn't know very well, I, I would just feel Lingram Poche is manifested here. So although I've got, you know, Lama, Lama Tenzing in front of me, I was thinking I've got Lingram Poche manifesting through this person. And that way, I received huge blessings because of my faith. So when it says, for example, I mean, the, the, the teachers are very important, you know, yes, absolutely. I mean, in fact, when you look at interdependence, you know, you needed mother and father to have a body, then you needed the two of them to talk to you in your particular language. Then you needed to go to school and have teachers and your all of the growth you had happened from interdependence, whether it was a official teacher or a just a helpful person like mother and father, grandmother, grandfather, all of those could qualify as gurus. And then, of course, especially for the Dharma, understanding reality, even more so, those teachers are so precious and so incredible. So uh, I, I just sort of, you know, again, having the correct understanding of teachers uh, and such. Uh, I, and then even in the six, or I'm sorry, in the 50 verses of Guru Devotion, it says, if you've been asked something by your teacher that you find uncomfortable, you can politely decline. You won't be born in hell. <laughs> you know, it just, just sort of, you know, politely decline. Say, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, or something, you know, it's okay. Um, I, as I said again in the first talk, the best teachers, I think, for most of us are teachers that are just very peaceful, loving, you know, wise, uh, patient, with very good ethics. Those are the best teachers for us because they give us a very good, you know, image or indication of what we want to become. Okay. So then uh, there's a verse 14a. I why I want to go a little bit fast is I want to move into the next section and you'll understand as I talk about it. So B1, requested in this way, my Supreme Guru comes to my crown, ja, Samaya Ja. Uh, once more, he joyfully, he or she joyfully becomes a, uh, one taste with me. Um, okay, uh, then, then it says with pride of Vajrasattva, I embrace Bhagavati while holding the secret Vajra, the symbol of innate great bliss, and the secret bell, the symbol of freedom from the elaborations of inherent existence. And this is the commitments of Ekshkobia. Now, this is the part, uh, try to make you be quite attentive. <clears throat> okay. Uh, for most of you, you're, you know, from your, you know, Canadian, American, Mexican, Costa Rican, whatever you are you know, and you have your birth certificate and such. And so you identify that way. And, you know, it's just based on causes and circumstances and interdependence, okay? When you practice Tantra, and especially when you receive the initiation, you are introduced to your Dharmakaya. So whether you completely can perceive it or not is not the question, but it's like you're given your actual birth certificate. So think of it this way, that like, let's say you're a Costa Rican, okay? So you think, oh, I'm Costa Rican, you know, I identify with the culture, you know, I speak the language, everything. And then one day somebody comes to you and says, no, I'm sorry, you know, actually we discovered like, you know, you're actually a Canadian. I mean, you can go to Canada now, you know, I mean, you, you are a Canadian completely. This is your birth certificate. This is all of the legality. So suddenly, you have all the benefits of being a Canadian, you know, the healthcare, social services, um, wonderful culture, <laughs> not quite as rich maybe as Costa Rica, you know, as rich in culture, but <laughs> so this is an example, you know, I, I say I'm Canada because I had I like Canada, you know, but the point is the net, so then you start to say, oh, oh, okay, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of Costa Rican stuff, but, you know, I'm actually Canadian, you know, wow. And you start to change your identification. That's exactly what happens when you get the initiation. 
you should try to see you're identifying with your dharmakaya. Now, synonyms of dharmakaya, your Buddha nature, the voidness, dharmakaya are all synonyms. They're not different. You should never think that your dharmakaya isn't with you. Um, there, there's two philosophies on that. One is right now in your consciousness, dharmakaya is functioning or your Buddha nature or whatever you want to call it. It is functioning. That's what one commentary. So you could say, although it's very subtle, very, very fine, and you can't really access it because we're too external, but it's there. Now, that, that's one thought. The second one is that actually it's there, but it's locked up inside the little what, indestructible dot in your heart. And until you open that indestructible dot, the dharmakaya can't function. But in both cases, really, you have dharmakaya. It's just whether you can access, well, we, we, most of us can't access it because we're too scattered. But the point is we have it. That's your birth certificate. So you try to start identifying, you know, my birth certificate, my passport, it's, it's dharmakaya. And so then you start to realign because there's the two main obstacles in practicing Tantra, mundane identification, a mundane image. Okay, those are the two things which basically keep you locked into samsara. So, what the, the mundane identification is like I'm a Costa Rican or I'm Mexican or I'm American or whatever. Okay, now there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's causes and circumstances as part of this thing, but you're actually getting a new birth certificate. My put in nature is my real birth certificate. And then from that, then I come into Sambodakaya and the Manakaya. Okay, now I don't want to go too fast, but I first you, you want to have that clarity. Now, in this, okay, I said, remember in the first class, you can meditate on trying to open your central channel or you know, trying to see the clear light, but first, particularly because it's central, because it's high tantra. If you you know in the sutrayana you get calm abiding, shamatha or shina, and then you think about, you, you reflect and you meditate on the nature of reality, empty of self-existence. And then you try to put those two together and it's within your mind, it's, you know, it's within your understanding. And that's very good. I mean, you need to even do it if you're practicing Tantra, okay? You don't, it's not like you don't have those. But when you move to Tantra, it, the example is this, that if you're sick and someone gives you a massage, that's really nice, you know, makes you feel a little better. But if someone came and gave you acupuncture, like put those little needles on the particular nerves that then stimulated the organs and whatever was necessary for your healing, it's much more powerful. That's exactly what Tantra is. Your sutra practice is very, very good. In fact, it's, it's crucial. You need it because it's your understanding, but it's like a massage. Tantra is acupuncture to the point that like stimulates specific organs perfectly. So when you practice Tantra, it's a central channel, okay? And you want to, you know, go into your heart chakra, you try to visualize, for example, a little moon cushion or sun cushion with the mantras and the seed syllable inside of the central channel at the level of your heart and, and such. Okay, now that, that's good. I mean, that's, you should do it. But let's say you have very deep faith in your teacher that they really have such and such an experience and you feel that they're one with your mind and then you feel that they are fully helping you they're like the grease that makes something move easy so like that then and then you go to your your heart chakra and you, you try to open the heart chakra but you feel your guru is there supporting you it's much more powerful and it's because of faith it's a big thing faith belief uh, and remember, in Buddhism, faith is confidence. It's called, in Tibetan, it's called Yiche, a confident mind. Now, 
with the confident mind comes the feelings, which is faith, and that's depa or depa in Tibetan. But the point is still, it is from a confident mind. So going to the voidness in this case, which is what you need to do, is you're going back to your innate nature where you really came from. You know, that's your, your real birth certificate. Okay, now what's the visualization? Okay, so the guru comes in one with you. I mean, you can just say, like, I go to the void. I mean, that's sort of one thing. But the more real one is, is that you feel the guru comes in your crown chakra, comes down into your heart, opens your central channel, and then everything evaporates. And now, remember, you're already the deity. Every day you're the deity. You never stop being the deity. I mean, maybe you don't identify too strongly, but you try to say, I'm always, you know, Vajradini, Haruka, Yamantaka, it really doesn't matter, but whatever deity I am. So you always feel like that. So when this happens, you are still the deity. It's just that you're getting a, a rekindling of the, of the guru's energy. And so you feel it comes inside of you. So then opens up your little heart chakra you know, inside the central channel. And with that, then the form of you being the deity that you brought to this meditation disappears, like evaporates. Now, uh, there's a couple points in this. Um, for me personally, uh, you know, I, I used to try to do this, but I always had this problem that earth's underneath me and things are around me and I could never really get them all to disappear. You know, there's still some sort of like sense there. So what I did was I started to think I'm at 30,000 feet in the sky. So I, I just completely put myself in a place where there's no physical phenomena there. Okay. And it's like, you, you think of it in terms of like, like, you know, you have around you the, the air, you know, well, oxygen and nitrogen and things. So you could think of like the, the molecules or whatever it would be, the atoms. But you, your mind is more fine than that. It goes down, I guess you could say, the electrons and quirks and such. But you have the idea you're at 30,000, like the guru absorbed in you, and then you just, everything disappears and you're at 30,000 feet open space of the sky and such. And you're floating there. Okay. Now, if you can try to be non dualistic with that, I am this open space of the sky. That's very important. Like non dualism is, is a big thing in Buddhism. It's why we can become a Buddha, because we're non dualistic. Most religions are dualistic. There's the ultimate being, God or whatever, and then there's you. And, and those two will never get together. Buddhism is a non dualistic religion. Enlightenment and you are one. It's just we're distracted by our delusion and such like that. So we can't perceive it. So in this case, we have our guru absorbed inside of us, opened our central channel in our heart, and we're at 30,000. Everything disappeared. So we have this complete openness of space. And of course, it says that you can try to be a bit blissful, uh, you know, bliss and voidness, that openness of the space of the sky. Okay. And then you just, you, then you have this identification. Uh, this is my real birth certificate. This is where I really come from. And Dharmakaya is self liberation. All the Buddhas, male or female, live within, or their, their personal freedom is their Dharmakaya. And again, this is really good to know because it's your guarantee that your tantric practice doesn't go wrong because as soon as you start to manifest that's your compassion sambhogakaya and nirmanakaya arise from the compassion the love and the compassion of the buddha the wish to benefit sentient beings now again if you study a lot you'll understand that's spontaneous the buddhas don't have to think about benefiting us but just for us as practitioners when I come out of my Dharmakaya and I'm going to manifest, I only did it for the benefit of sentient beings. That's a really good way of formatting, putting context to your practice. So it's not like I want power, I want to influence people, I want bliss, I want something special, you know, I want an epiphany. It's none of those things. It's I came for the benefit of sentient beings. Now, if you get bliss and epiphany, it's great. <laughs> but the point is, is that you, you are for the benefit of sentient beings. Now, in this case, again, now, 
The next thing uh, in verse uh, B3, okay, Geshe Rafton told me, he said, you do not have to become Vajrasattva. You need to become a tantric deity. So whether it's Heruka, Yamantaka, Vajogini, Buya Samaja, Hevadra, uh, you know, whoever, uh, Vajrakalaya, or any of the Anuttara class deities, you can become any one of them because it is Anuttara class. Now, you of course need the initiation, but the thing is, so although it says with, with the pride of Vajrasattva, I embrace Vajrakalini, you could say, I am Yamantaka in union, union with Vajravetali, that's the consort. Or I am Haruka in union with Vajra Yogini, or I am Guya Samaja in union with my consort. You know, so you could become any of those deities. And again, if you have a practice in one of those which is important to you, that would be good. Again, one thing you do when you do become whatever deity you're going to manifest. Remember, so the guru absorbed with you, you were clear light, open space of the sky, 30,000 feet. Then when consciousness moves a little bit, you say, okay, may I benefit sentient beings? And you become a whom syllable, a bum syllable, you know, whatever syllable you want. And again, there's, I, I don't have time to do all the teachings, but they're saying, they say, that's your Sambhogakaya. It has the five special qualities of being very subtle. It's an astral form. You know, it's only surrounded by high level bodhisattvas, only teaches Mahayana and Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, it's in a pure land and has a spontaneously appearing consort. Okay. So that, that's the five qualities of assembled the kaya. So anyway, you, you are that. You're a subtle form. So let's just say you're the seed syllable, which is the easy version of that. Okay. Um, okay. So I am that. I'm for the benefit of sentient beings. And then you say, okay, but hey, I'm so subtle. Nobody can perceive me. Nobody can understand me. I need to be more coarse. More, more manifest. And then so that whom syllable turns into the deity of your choice. So again, Yamantaka, Vajradini, whatever deity you wish, but and the Anantara Yoga, not, not just the, the, like Avalokitesh Varantara. Although if you did that, uh, you could say, you know, I am Haruka or I'm Vajradini, but at this moment I need to be Tara for somebody. Okay, so you, you can do it. You, can, you have flexibility. Um, I always joke that, you know, if you think about bodhisattvas, they have to be unbelievably skillful because there's so many weird sentient beings out there and bodhisattvas want to benefit them. So they have to be very skillful. It's not just sort of like, you know, uh, you know, renounce samsara, practice virtue, you know, like I said, it's some sentient beings that want to help them. So you have to say something that's pertinent to them. So um, there is a story at the time of Buddha Shakyamuni, actually, that there was one very hedonistic young man who was a, was a prince or something like that, royal family, like rich family, okay, it's like sort of like a, maybe um, you know Stephen Jobs' son or maybe um, Bill Gates' son or something like that, very rich family, you know, so he loved to party. You know. Anyway, but in, then one day, in, the, in his group of sort of social friends, they said, hey, there's this guy, the Buddha, you know, and he, he's over in the, he's in the neighborhood. Let me go visit him. You know, he's sort of, I hear he's pretty cool. And they said, oh, okay, yeah. So they all went over there and, and the, you know, Buddha's there, he's a missing, he's <laughs> got things. And he perceived the mind of this rich, young male. And so he just is giving general teachings. And then he said, oh, you know, the, if you think this realm is good with, you know, wine and, you know, wine and women and song, oh, you've not experienced the God realm. God realm, much better. You know, so the guy sort of went, hmm, you know, he's a bit ambitious. So I want that. So when his friends all left, he went to Buddha Shakyamuni, he did three prostrations, he says, please teach me how to go to the God realm. So Buddha didn't talk about morality or anything. This is okay. This is how you meditate, taught me how to meditate, and this and that. Anyway, and so then, he, he did a lot. He sort of basically stopped partying, started meditating a lot and stuff. I mean, he was quite moved, uh, I guess, to the blessings of the Buddha, you know. And so then, then he started to gain more you know, experiences. And then he arrived to the God realm. And I went, wow, this is so good. You know, this is a bliss and everything like this, you know. Really like, well, yes, I got it, you know. And, 
turned on a, a continuous orgasm, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. So anyway, he was there. And he said, whoa, this is so good, you know. Anyway, and then he came back to the board and he said, thank you so much. And he says, well, you see, because now you're quite sensitive. Just check up what happens when you stop being in, in the God realm. He went, okay. So he went back into his meditation, went to the God realm. And then he saw, oh, you can get the rebirth in the bad realm. You know, because I'm using up all my karma that I have to be in the God realm. And when that karma, karma is exhausted, I can fall. Now, you might fall to just being a human, but you could also fall to the lower realms. And he had quite good psychic power, and he could see the lower realms. He went, Holy shit, you know, <laughs> like freaked him out really badly. And so then, then he went back to the Buddha and he said, please, you know, help, help me. What am I going to do? He says, okay. So then the Buddha taught him about your nature of reality, blah, 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 and he became an Arat. Okay, so that's skillful means. And Bodhisattvas, you know, any one of you, if, you know, it's not like, you know, for most of us, you know, we have to be virtuous, but really like some of your friends might not be able to do that. So maybe you just have to say, hey, you know, if they say, oh, you're such a nice person, then you can say, oh yeah, I meditate. Don't, don't be elaborate, just don't meditate. Oh, okay, what's that? You know, and then you slowly, you know, introduce them to that. And, and you don't have to make somebody a Buddhist. It's just make them a better person. That's the, the path of, towards enlightenment. Maybe they then they say, oh, wow, you're really smart. You know, I really like you. You know, what's going on? Well, I'm going to, I'm attending teachings, you know. Oh, what? Buddhism. Oh, okay. You see, so I mean, that's skillful means. That's what Bodhisattvas really are. They're incredibly skillful. Now, of course, you know, all of our lamas are, you know, manifested for the benefit of us, skillful means. Okay, but again, I, I like to think of it in those terms that bodhisattvas are unbelievably skillful. So, my real birth certificate is Dharmakaya. That's my personal freedom. I'm at 30,000 feet in space, open, clear of the sky. This, there, I'm union oneness with that i'm not dualistic with that it's not like i'm looking at open space to the sky i am open space to the sky um, i heard an interesting talk by one teacher that said one of the main causes of when we when we die that we take a rebirth is we're very uncomfortable with not having a body so i i thought that was interesting so you know i, I spent a little bit more time just sort of being open space to the sky, you know, and try not to, to be worried about, you know, like, what well, well, I want the body, you know, this kind. so it's an interesting thought, but they, they do say one of the main causes of rebirth is fear or uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable being in the bardo. I'm uncomfortable being thing. And, you know, when we die, we all go to the, our Buddha nature, the Dharmakaya. We will go there automatically, irrespective. We have a free airplane ticket to Dharmakaya. There's two problems. If we're an ordinary person, we may have no ability to have any understanding. We have no meditation capacity. So it means that we're just going to go in there. We're most likely go unconscious. And then we go through Dharmakaya. Um, Geshe Rathman said that. He said, we've been through the Dharmakaya a billion times, but we didn't have anything to catch it. Okay. So if you are a meditator, you do have a little bit more ability. And if you're a good meditator, you can have better ability to go into the death process, which is, you know, the standard practice in Anatara Yoga, eight visions at the time of death. You get to go there and you get to then say, I'm open space to the sky. I am in my most subtle form, my subtle mind and energy. I'm there and I'm, I'm union one with that. And I'm, you know, I don't have a problem. I'm not afraid of that. Okay. Then, then the next thing is, well, may I be a benefit? You become a syllable whom or bum or whatever. And then you turn into the deity for the benefit, again, for compassion, for the benefit of all sentient beings. Now, if you do have the eight visions at the time of death, you could do it at this time. I said at the beginning of this class, your six session guru yoga could be a complete tantric practice. Maybe it's not as elaborate as a particular sadhana of a deity, but having become the deity, okay, whatever deity, 
you could then add your mantras. So there's the four mantras of Yamantaka, Arabaz, Nadi, Yamaraja, Kriya Shri, and Yamadagunda. You could do those mantras for a little while, being, you know, be, you know having become the Nirmanakaya. Or maybe you could do Heruka, Om Shri, Vajahehe, Ruru, Kam, Kum, Pei, Dakimu, Zalajamara, and Soha. And then you could do the other mantras too, if you want, like the Vajabarahe, and things like that. Or you could do uh, you know, Vajyogini, and then again, your Kadvanga is your consort, it comes down, it's so your union with. If, the, if you're a woman, you might then do that, that, and you do om, 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 so you might do it 10, 20, 30 times, whatever you, you want. So it, it, it's never said in this commentary, but you could do your mantras at this point if you wish to. You know, again, depends. We're, we're lay people. We don't have tons and tons of time. Okay. So as I said, today, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about this particular component of the guru, of the six session guru yoga receiving the guru and in regards to that never think like the guru uh doesn't like you you know some people do that it's sort of you know especially like you know i've been a bad person you know so the buddha moved away um yeah that's a very very narrow view if we think of buddhas or gurus we should think they have no fear so let's say I always think, okay, the Buddha, the Guru is right here. Dalai Lama is right here at the side of my face. He's right there with me. Okay. And then I start to have negative thoughts. It's not like the Lama says, ooh, you know, Dalai is getting negative. Give me a boy. No. Those Buddhas have no fear. They don't have anything. They're not worried about that. They understand the emptiness of those particular delusions. They have compassion, in fact. And they say, oh, you're making yourself deluded. Oh, I'm on your family home. You know, compassion to you. So never think. That the gurus go away or come closer that's a limited view of gurus and buddhas feel that they're always right there and that they're always willing to help now obviously if you're being consumed by a delusion anger or desire at that moment you're a bit, it's a bit complicated but you shouldn't think that they're not there for you i mean they don't have fear they can manage that sort of those feelings you know so that then when you do calm down a little bit then you go okay you know and then you sort of okay you know do help me uh, i have uh one friend in, in canada that once said to me he said anytime i have a really intense situation come in front of me i always just say what would lani yeshi do because he had great faith in lani yeshi and that immediately gave him options just a silly little thought but Okay, and this thing, what would Lani Yeshi do? So then, then suddenly you have a whole new way of relating to that problem rather than just saying, Me, I've got this, and you're making me angry, and then, you know, whatever sort of nasty words you might say. <laughs> I said, What would Dalai Lama do? What would Lama Zoka do? What would Garchuna Pusha do? What would, you know, whoever your Lamas are? Okay, so, so there, there's some. Some, some, something to think about in regards to receiving the guru. So uh, your guru, guru yoga practice is very, very important. Uh, and, and then that helps your practice be much stronger. Okay. And then you feel that they're one with your mind. Okay. Uh, good. And then, then you see go to voidness. And that's your dharmakaya. You can do the eight visions at the time of death at that point, if you wish. Then, then you say, okay, out of compassion, may I benefit some beings, you manifest a syllable home. It's nothing but empathy, love, and compassion for some beings. It's very supple, though. It's your astral body. And you say, okay, it's not still like, I need to be more. And then, boom, come back into your body. Now, I, I do something. I don't know if it's official, but I sometimes think, okay, I'm Yamantaka, but okay, uh, I, out of my great skillful means as Yamantaka, I turn into Jampa. Why not? You know, I mean, it's just, you know, it makes it more, more, more easy. But in the background, I always have, no, I've got Yamantaka there. Yamantaka is there with me. He's, he's helping me and such like that. Or Haruka and such like that. Okay. So the, 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 this, is, this is really in the stage of generation. This is the main practice. Transforming death, lardo, rebirth into Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Ramanakaya. And in this practice, you have a great opportunity to do that. 
And so then, you know, as it goes in the commentary, if, if you were, you know, became Vajrasafa, then, you know, you hold the Vajra, which is great bliss, and you hold the bell with the voidness, you cross them in front of your chest, which says, I have a union and bliss and voidness. Now, this is where, um, you know, if you're a good meditator, and I'll talk about this when I do the Vajrayogini teachings in, in England, you know, you actually can generate something and it'll keep giving you that message. You know, it, it's something if you're, say, if you spend some time in meditation, then, okay, we're not monks and nuns, so maybe we don't get a lot of time. But if you start to generate something, you put a little bit of, of what it means there for you. So, I mean, let's just say, <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, so you put, uh, you know, you visualize chocolate cake, you know, and your mouth waters and, and this and that. But you keep it there saying chocolate cake. Okay. And so you keep generating, I guess, saliva in your mouth. Okay. That's a silly example, but I'm trying to give it something to make it more real for you. So if you have a, an experience where you say, let's just do the graduated path, you know, precious human rebirth. Wow. You know, I won the lottery ticket of a precious human rebirth. And I, that example I like because it's very positive. Because, you know, let's say if you did win, you know, 20 million, 30 million pesos, or maybe you win two or $3 million, okay. You know, are you going to sit at home saying, oh, I want all the money, I don't know. No, you're going to go out and spend it. You're, you're going to give it to your mother and your father, your brothers and your sisters or something. Are you going to do something wonderful, nice with it? You know, it's like, even you sort of, I wish the stores would open. Damn it, you know, I've got my $3 million, you know, wow, I want to do it. Okay, that if you catch your precious human rebirth in the right perspective every morning you wake up in ecstasy i've got a precious human rebirth i won the lottery ticket of a really good rebirth and even if you're a little sick or if you're old you still have precious human rebirth you know because you can practice you have the limits i mean all the eight freedoms and the ten endowments you know which are worthwhile to think about you know they um the, the, the precious human rebirth is actually a meditation of comparison. What would it be like if you were born in some horrible place? You know, no Dharma teachings, a lot of violence, a lot of theft, maybe a lot of hunger. You know, like I, I was thinking the other day about, you know, let's say some of these places in Brazil where there's the, you know, the people that live at the side of these rivers where they're doing all the clear-cut forestry, you know, and they have these sort of spontaneous little shanty towns pop up, you know, and there's no septic thing. Everybody just goes and pees and poos in the river and stuff, and, and there's no education. I mean, what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to chop down trees and, you know, change the climate and make the world horrible and things like that. I mean, whoa, would I like a rebirth there? No, I don't. I want to, you know, rebirth, you know, with some options and possibilities, you know. So you think of that, and then you go, whoa, comparison. I don't want that. You know, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a silly example. Um, okay, I lived in India for 14 years. There were no flushing toilets where I live. You went off into the forest. Okay, I'm serious, you know. Maybe some places had outhouses, you know. But actually, in India, you don't want to use an outhouse. They're so filthy. <laughs> you know, it's horrible. <laughs> anyway, so... Anyway, so I have 14 years of experience of going off into the forest and trying not to have mosquitoes bite me as I go to the bathroom or something like that, you know, like that. So I'm now in, in Torreon, and in a joking way, I do three prostrations to the toilet. Thank you so much, toilet. You're just so nice, you know, I wanted to be there. And I do three prostrations to hot and cold running water and a hot shower. I mean, I used to have to take a a bath with a bucket and a cup and splash water on my body you know so now i just turn a dial and within a few seconds i've got hot water all over my body and oh you know so i have a great comparison no bathroom facilities and bathroom facilities now I'm, I'm not going to do prostrations to the toilet but turn around and make it not such a beneficial rebirth and in a good rebirth and i'm sorry all of us, even if we have some difficult situation, maybe money or relationship or even health, 
we still have a good reverse. We won a lottery ticket. Maybe it's not the $3 million, but it's still a good reverse. So feel that. Okay, so you can generate perfect human rebirth. Maybe it's seen in some, Im some image in something in your mandala. And then that continuously gives you that, that thing. Or, you know, impermanence. You know, possessions are impermanent, relationships are impermanent, your body's impermanent. Okay, that's all the skulls, all the, the bone ornaments of you as a deity. So if you have clarity that when you die, all your possessions will be given to some secondhand store. There's nobody going to value them. It's, oh God, look at this, you know, it's so ugly, you know. You know, the clothes you have, your shoes, you're going to say, God, these shoes, how can you wear these shoes? You know, <laughs> you're going to throw them away, you know, <laughs> like that. But you, oh, these are my shoes. This is my shirt, you know, this shirt, I look so handsome. Or my blouse, I look so good, so sexy, you know. And for somebody else, it's going to be garbage, you know. So don't exaggerate it. You know, so you get clarity. Things are impermanent. Don't exaggerate these things. I mean, wearing nice clothes is good. Makes you attractive. Makes you more influential in helping other people. You say, oh, you're an attractive person. You dress well. You have a good haircut. Why? Because I meditate. <laughs> Skillful means. Okay, so you can use yourself, who you are, what social level you're at. You can use that as skillful means for sentient means. So if you are very rich, great, you know, help sentient beings. If you're not so rich, great, help sentient beings, you know, be peaceful and loving and kind and wise and thoughtful and things like that. Okay, so all the bone ornaments represent that. So you could have, you know, the skulls or whatever. And then you, you, you so you generate in your meditation, a skull or, or let's say some bone ornaments. And in your mind, it gives you the continuum information. Possessions are not important. And you can get that, or, you know, again, like your body, you can say, like, my, your body's the thing that's, that's going to kill you. You realize that? Like, every day we get up and we bathe it, and then we feed it very good yogurt and fruits, and then we, again, put creams and perfumes on it, and then we go to lunchtime, and we have great tasting tacos and this and that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then we dress it in beautiful clothing and stuff, and we walk around feeling really good about who we are, and the sucker's the thing that's going to kill you. Like such a dead end investment. Now, you should dress well and you should eat well, have a long life. You practice in Tantra, you know, be of benefit. So, if you are handsome and well dressed, or if you're beautiful and attractive, use that as one of your things to help sentient beings, you know, turn it into an asset. That's the Bodhisattva attitude. If we were Theravada or Hinayana practitioners, attachments are the devil and they're the, you know, the enemy and you reject them. But as a bodhisattva, you can use everything in a constructive way. It's about attitude and it's good. Be, 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 be sincere and but don't be false about it. But the thing is, yeah, you know, so use your, you use those things, use who you are. If you drive a BMW, so what, you know, like, be compassionate, give people's rides in your BMW, you know, and if people sort of notice you, you know, again, you can say, well, gee, you're doing pretty good, aren't you? You're pretty successful. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> it's a doorway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, I'm talking about Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. And hopefully I'm just okay with all this. Um, so the thing is, is, is that, that that's what I really wanted to focus on for tonight. Okay, so that that concludes most of what I wanted to say. Next next or tomorrow night, Sunday, I'll go through all the final bits of prayers and stuff like that. Uh, the things that we need. So um, at this point, I'm going to stop the recording because this is going to go on YouTube in a while. But I'm going to open it for questions. So.